<laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> He's going to get a kick out of that. That it's offset. There you go. <laughs> it should get easier from here out because it's one book right after another. Now you're not blending it in, you know, with the, with the book of Acts after tonight. Well, hopefully after tonight. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, I am by faith. We're getting Paul's journey to Rome tonight. We'll <laughs> All right, let's pull it together, guys, and uh, dive back into the book of Romans. Can somebody pray and get us started off? And we'll see what we can do to finish out Romans this week and even finish out Acts this week. Finish two books tonight. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. Well, let's go. All right. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for enabling us to be able to enjoy, to know your word, to be able to, to soak it in so that we may be able to use it for our everyday life, Lord. We ask you mm -hmm. to help us to understand the, the different passages as we study them now so that we'll be able to uh, uh, expand upon them even after we leave this place. That we'll be able to understand even more and more every time we read it. Mm -hmm. And help us to be able to uh, take it forth to be able to bring more into your kingdom. We ask that you'll continue to bless Pastor Steve with the knowledge that he has to be able to explain the scriptures in such a, uh, an easy way of knowing your word, Lord. He, he just makes it so plain and so simple. We just thank you, Lord, for his wisdom that you have given to him mm. and how willing he is to follow your path. We ask it in the name of Jesus that you'll take care of this night, that we'll be blessed by it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so let's, um, before we get to Paul's journey to Rome... Uh, let's finish up this section about the Jews. We started on chapters 9, 10, and 11, which are really important to understand. And unfortunately, because today there's still a lot of confusion about Israel, the land, all the war going on in the Middle East, and all these perennial issues. And it's really important that we have a good understanding of what the scriptures mean by Israel. What is their, you know, do they have a right to the promised land? Is that part of their current covenant promise with God? Um, all these things are answered really in these three chapters. So let's, uh, let's dive back in and hope you came with questions and insight into the passage after reading it. So back up to chapter 10 for a second. Um, uh, Paul really goes out of his way to make sure everybody understands this is not, I'm not upset with the Jews because they whip me everywhere I go. I'm not upset because they continually reject the gospel that we preach. I still have a desire to see them saved. I have, uh, I'm, I'm eager to see them come to the knowledge of Messiah. But uh, I testify about them. They have a zeal for God. So he commends them. Look, they have zeal, all right? I can show you their zeal and all these stripes on my back I've received. They have a zeal for it, but it's not according to knowledge. So, hey, so they got to update their files. They have to upgrade their covenant to the new covenant. And we'll, we'll get deeper into this when we get to the book of Hebrews. We've already looked at Galatians, which deals with it really strong, I think. But Hebrews really lays out how the old covenant is not just, this isn't just a, like an appendix, like you know how we can amend our constitution. The new covenant is not an amendment to the old covenant. It's a complete replacement of the old covenant. There is nothing of the old covenant still valid for today. All right, so we'll prove that when we get to Hebrews more strongly. So just if you could trust me on that and keep that as a foundation right now, you can read this passage and really understand what Paul's getting at. So they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. Why? Because they didn't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Let's see if we could pull back. We already we, we looked at this early on in Romans. What is the righteousness of God? What does Paul mean by that? Remember, it's not our righteousness that's being discussed, not human righteousness. How is the righteousness of God revealed now, New Covenant time? Through the word of the Holy Spirit within us. Okay, so we have the law of God written on our heart, the internal work of the Holy Spirit. How is the righteousness of God made known to all the earth? The creation. Jesus Christ. Creation through Jesus Christ. Good. His righteousness that we take on ourselves. There's nothing we do, but he did. Exactly. 
All right, so the cross reveals the righteousness of God. The cross reveals both the fact of sin, or the cross was unnecessary, but it also reveals that mercy has now been made available and righteousness from the inside out instead of from the outside in, which is how the law works, right? So that's the righteousness of God. So just to be clear, because this unfortunately is still a source of confusion, there is no salvation for the Jew outside the new covenant. There are no covenant promises for the Jew outside the new covenant, which means anything, if you're going to trace your bloodline and find whether you're a native-born Jew or not, do the 23 and Me thing or whatever, which I'm eager to do because we do have Jewish blood, but it's totally irrelevant in Christ. That's all I care about that we're clear about, that in Christ, in the new covenant period for the last 2,000 years, your national heritage has zip to do with your relationship with God and your covenant with God. So that's what Paul's getting at, because remember, first century, this was a cataclysmic shift in the world, not just for the Jew, for the whole world. In order to get to know the God, Jehovah, Yahweh, you had to come through his people, through the revelation given them by Moses. If you wanted to worship that God, there was only one nation on the planet that had it. Okay, so, so this was a big shift. We're not, getting, we're not blaming the Jews. We're not like, dude, what's your problem? Because we're 2,000 years into knowing that God's Father, and, and Christians still need to hear that message. So let's not, you know, we don't judge the Jew for having a hard time updating to the New Covenant. Because they didn't even have the scriptures yet. They just had the preaching. Hopefully trusting that these men know what they're talking about. Because if I'm going to abandon Moses, 15 centuries worth of worship that way given by God from Mount Sinai, I hope I can trust you, Peter, James, John, Paul. That's all they had to work with. We've had the scriptures for 2,000 years and we still, man, you talk about God as Father and you could have a 1,000 people weeping who have walked with Christ for 20, 20 years. So, no judgment to the Jew for failing to update their files quickly, right? Um, so, verse 12, he says, No distinction between Jew and Greek in matters of faith. There's never been a distinction for that matter. Uh, the issue that Paul's getting at is that plan A, the way that God, with the opportunity God gave Israel, was, I'm going to work my law in you. I'm going to show the world what paradise can look like. When a people walk in love, if they really would have gotten the heart of the law, that was what God was trying to work through in Israel. They were never faithful to the covenant on their end. They never followed God in it. Finally, in 70 AD, they lost their land once and for all. But they forgot that their calling was to be a blessing to all the nations. Abraham's promise, I'll bless you, make it to be a blessing. All the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. Over and over again, the prophets would remind them, you're going to go to the Gentiles. They're going to come and seek your faith. They're going to come to Jerusalem and say, show us your God, teach us your ways. That was God's idea for them. They forsook that. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, said, I'm pulling the kingdom away from you and I'm going to give it to others who will be faithful with it. So what Paul's whole argument here is, for all of those who are watching, is look, this doesn't mean that God is going to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. And that's the distinction that's being made here. The promise of God to them, for the sake of their fathers, as he put it, was that I'm not going to wipe every Jew off the planet. With all, you know, Adolf Hitler attempted it long before him. Mordecai attempted it. Not Mordecai. Who's a bad guy? Haman. Haman. <laughs> Mordecai sounds like a bad guy name to me. I don't know why. Haman wanted to wipe all the Jews off the face of the earth. God said, I'm never going to let that happen. And out of the remnant, the people who have remained faithful to me, the people who were faithful when Jesus preached, they understood. They said, this is the God that we worship because they were soft-hearted toward God. They were the faithful, and their faithfulness got revealed because they recognized Jesus. They followed Him, became disciples. So the whole thing is, all right, so now they forgot their calling. They rejected their seed. They rejected their, their, their own seed, Messiah. They rejected their call to the Gentiles. Now they need to be reached. And so Jesus prophesied that in Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to send to you prophets and wise men and scribes. I'm sending you, the Jews, these things because you need to be re-evangelized. You forgot who you are. So, uh, so that's chapter 10. Coming into chapter 11 now, this is, the, this is the passage I think that most people really trip over and get lost on because it says all Israel will be saved. Did you catch that? How many of you learned a teaching? Usually it comes along with some end time teaching. 
They're right before the return of the Lord who will physically descend onto Mount, you know, the mountain in Jerusalem will come to the mount where the temple once stood. That's where he's going to land when he comes back to the earth. And it's going to come after a big national revival in Israel. And every single Israelite, every Jew on the earth is going to be saved during that time. You're frowning at me. Have you heard that one before? Shake your head yes if you've heard it. because <laughs> All right, maybe this is me. It's prominent enough out there. And there are people, therefore, that are zealous to see the Jews rebuild the temple because they think that's what Revelation says is going to happen. There's, they're really eager to see Israel possess all of the promised land because God's promise has to be fulfilled and that's when Messiah returns. And Jesus said, I will not return to you unless you say to me, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when that happens, so they say, that's when Jesus returns and that's... I forget if that's the first return or the second one before the secret. I get lost in some of the interpretation of that. But anyway, that's, that's the thing. So we're grafted. And this is the confusing passage. So tell me first what you see in this passage. What's the whole image of branches being broken off so that we're grant, grafted in? We don't support the root. The root supports you. What is the root? Who are the branches? And how do Jew and Gentile interact with this whole grafting process? Well, we're grafted into the, with the Jews, of the believing Jews, and the ones that are not believing are the ones that are cut off. Um, okay, so the unbelieving Jews are cut off from the vine. Okay. We were grafted in, those that believe, and the root is Jesus. Okay, the root is Jesus, okay. <laughs> right? Who's, what's, who's the root of Jesse? Jesse was David's father. Mm -hmm. The root of da Jesse, who David prophesied, the root, that was, well, Jesus. The root of Jesse was a prophecy about Jesus. So, yeah, the root that supports Israel was Jesus. But really what the, the picture is, we have become spiritual heirs of everything that God's done among His people. Long before Abraham was born, before, certainly before Israel was born, who, be, you know, who became the father of the nation of Israel, we have as our spiritual heritage everything that's happened since the Garden of Eden. That all belongs to us. Like our family celebrates Passover every year, and we celebrate it not as a religious obligation. I don't believe in celebrating the feast per se, but just as a good teaching opportunity for my children so that we tap into our heritage goes back to Adam who, by the way, is not at the bottom of the lowest level of hell, with all respect to Dante, right? Was that Dante's Inferno? That was a weird book, man. I remember. Anyway, he, Adam is a believer, okay? Adam, Adam is saved. Adam was covered. Adam's, I think Adam's going to be there. And we'll get to ask him and get to slap him across the face. For, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, so our, that's the point, the point of this passage is the root. Our spiritual heritage traces all the way back to there. Does anybody's spiritual heritage have anything to do with their nationality, including the Jew? I hope we saw that strongly enough in these chapters right here. Who is the true Jew? Who? The believers, the believing Jew. One who believes in Jesus. How about before Jesus? Did, did things change just because Jesus came on the scene, or was there always something else that God was about among His chosen people? It's always been by faith. He who is a Jew is not one outwardly, nor a circumcision outward, but it's the circumcision of the heart, right? He who is a Jew who is one inwardly. So it's never, Paul's whole point is look, guys, this, ne this didn't change even for na native born as Hebrews just because we have a new covenant. Not everybody who was born into Israel has eternal life. You can name a few people. You go back and read the book. There were some demons who ruled over Israel. And man, they were just crazy. Made Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy. Some of the things these guys did. I mean, burning their kids alive in Moloch's hands. I mean, it was nuts what they did. So the notion that just because I was born into this means that I have eternal life and I'm automatically God's chosen people Paul's whole point is that's never been the case. In fact, what got revealed here, you got cut off. The Jew has to be regrafted. So there is nobody left. It's almost like the picture could almost be, we just pruned all the branches off. And if you want Messiah, you've got to be grafted back in. So Paul's point really is that, look, the Jews are always going to be around. 
God's not going to let them get wiped off the face of the earth. Why? For the sake of their pro- the covenant to their fathers. So there always have been Jews. The last 2,000 years of history show us they're pretty resilient as a nation. There have been a lot of attempts to wipe them out. It's on the rise again now. Why the Jews of all people? At this point, Israel is such an insignificant nation when you think about it. Uh, in terms of the earth, you look at the size of it, where it is. It, it's just an insignificant country compared to all the nations that surround it. Why is everybody always after the Jew? Well, they, they do. They, they have been carriers of the promises of God for all that time. Is there any confusion left about that? I didn't want to dwell on that too long with you. Hopefully that passage was clear, but I want to make sure you don't have any questions remaining. I have a, um, a question you can ask, though. Okay. How this. Yeah. Um, he says in Acts about Jews keeping the law. Mm-hmm. He wants them to keep the law. He does the, the vow thing, right? And he says, I kept the law. So he's all about keeping the law to the Jews in Acts. But yet he says here about not we shouldn't be keeping the law okay so i think there's there actually right in this passage is something that will help with that christ is the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe so with paul remember his heart when he wrote in, to the corinthians he said to the jew i became a jew to those under the law as one under the law in other words i'm not subjecting myself to the law by any stretch However, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I really love those people. And if I go in there, they already know what I've been teaching about Moses, the law of Moses. They're going to rip me limb from limb. But if I go having just fulfilled a Nazarite vow, they might be open to hear what I have to say. And maybe they won't try to kill me this time. So that was Paul's heart with that. So he wasn't saying, I'm forsaking the new covenant, putting myself back under the law of Moses. He was saying, I become as one who is under the law, not actually one who is under the law. Does that make sense? Did I? Kind of. <laughs> so, in other words, like, well, my family's an example. We celebrate the Passover. I don't believe that enhances our life in Christ. I don't believe that God is, like, we gain favor with God by doing that. I do it with my children as a teaching tool. We go through salvation. We go through our family strongholds and tear those down while we're going through the Passover. What are the things that we, we have still going on? I recruit my kids to join us in tearing down whatever idols of Egypt still remain in our family. So we use it like that. And we just celebrate Christ. And the fact that for 35 centuries, He's been right here in the middle of this feast, celebrated by you know, first His chosen people and now by all those who want it as a teaching tool. So it enhances us, but as far as righteousness, absolutely not. Not a bit. doesn't move us closer to Jesus at all, except that we do it because we feel like it's something we should do. Yeah, Ben? Um, I don't remember the exact passage you're talking about, but from what Dad was was saying, with him completing the Nazarite vow and stuff, um, as an evangelist, when you go to a different culture, you can't assimilate to, to an extent. And in this particular culture, he was going to the Jews. He had to assume certain rights and act in a certain way, like he said, so he wouldn't get killed in from them, right? So the Nazareth vow was his way of saying, I'm not endorsing this as a necessity or a requirement for salvation, but I'm doing it to assimilate enough to where you'll hear what I'll say on equal ground. So it wasn't like a requirement, it was just something he did to, to get some things. They would listen. Well said. Does that get at what you were? I think so. Okay. Well, tell us if there's anything, like what's the... If you could think of whatever it is to help clarify it, I hope I got it right, yeah. what you were asking. But yeah. Craig, you had a question. I, I just want to stand up for Adam. For Adam. <laughs> for, Do it, Craig. Only because I think of it this way, that... If obviously we don't like what we're going through because of what happened, but if Adam wouldn't have done that, instead of two people being tricked, there'd be thousands, ten to thousands, hundreds, and that tree would still be there. So that temptation would always be there. Somebody could always screw it up. But because he did that, 
God put in place a way for us to have salvation that there will come a point when there will be no more tree mm -hmm. and temptation. So if he wouldn't have done it, then any one of us could because the tree would always be there and Satan would always be tempting people. And sooner or later, if he did it to two, if there was millions or billions, it probably wouldn't be too hard to get somebody else to do it. So yeah. the end result, even though what we go through, the end result is that tree will be removed and we will not have to be tempted by Satan anymore. Mm -hmm. you're, I mean, that's, we read that in Romans. You're, you're paraphrasing Romans 5, really, that if it weren't for Adam's sin, we wouldn't know what grace was about. A, an aspect of God got revealed. Thank you, Adam, for revealing the grace of God. But I'm still really mad about all the disease, and now I've got to go till my garden to plant stuff. But, you know, <laughs> no, I hear you. And that's a really good point, and I appreciate that. No, no sympathy for the devil, but sympathy for Adam. We'll, we'll do that. All right. All right, good. All right, any other questions about the Jew? All righty. So let's move on into New Covenant life. Chapters 12 through 15, you'll notice, was there anything new in these three chapters, uh, four chapters rather, that hasn't been covered somewhere else in one of the other books? Do you notice they're all common themes? Yeah. It maybe developed them a little more, maybe it was more specific, even some new phrases in it. But you could see it's almost like Paul traveling, establishing churches, having been in ministry now for 25 years that there were certain little nuggets of wisdom that he realized these are the major things that churches are facing today. And let's bring some eternal principles into how to deal with them so the body of Christ can continue to walk with the Lord and be built up. So chapter 12, um, with a passage about living sacrifices, and then we have the gifts of grace, as we call them, because that's how it opens up. Uh, present your body as a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. And then um, don't think more highly of yourself than you, want, you ought to, verse 3. But think as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Verse 6, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And so these are called the gifts of grace because of that phrase right there. So um, we don't have time for an extensive teaching in the gifts of grace. We do that every once in a while here to help, help figure out, you know, what's going on? What is the, what's the one that you really excel at? What's God put in you to do? It's a really good way of knowing your identity. In Christ, the hand knows what it is because it knows what it can do. And although we're not defined by what we do, an aspect of how God wired us is what we naturally do. We say naturally, it feels natural to us but it's a gift of the grace of God. Amen. I'll never forget when this came clear to me it was with uh, Rodney Westhafer down at Christ Community Church, who's, he's kind of like Joel and Craig. When he just, he looks at a problem and instantly he's got all of it mapped out how to, how to solve the problem. He's an incredible administrator, really gifted at building, doing, I mean, a man could do anything, it seems. And uh, we were talking one day, he was expressing frustration at the pastors who weren't very practical minded. And so, you know, we we're, were having a little bit of tension between the gifts. And I asked him, um, do you realize how good you are at administration? How natural it comes to you? It's, and and we, what it came down to is he realized, you know, it, it just seems, seems so natural to me. I get upset because everybody else can't do it like I can do it. It's one of the ways of knowing what your gift is. What frustrates you that other people can't do? This might save your marriage right here because <laughs> it's grace, your grace to do it. So it's uh, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. And it's a really good study when you can take the time to do it. There's an exhortation given to each one, right? So to he who serves, what's the exhortation given to the one who serves? Or let's start our prophecy. If it's prophecy... What's the exhortation to the one who's prophesying? How do you use it? In proportion to your faith. Mm -hmm. So don't go further than what your faith in you, what, what the Lord said to you. Stay within the bounds of what's been revealed to you and don't shift. Just prophesy. Speak that word. The one who, uh, the one who gives. Verse 8. How, how should you give if you got a gift of giving? 
generously. Don't just give. Give generously. The one who leads. How should you lead? Diligence. See, to just go in and dive all in with it. Leadership, by the way, can also be translated administration. The gift of administration simply means you have a big picture way of pulling things together to get the job done. That's what leadership in a nutshell is uh, on that gift. Uh, how about um, showing mercy? With cheerfulness. This is a good one for all of all those who are like bleeding heart lovers of the downtrodden. And uh, there's a tendency to get sucked into people's issues and stuff and then get mad that everybody else isn't down there in the dirt with you helping these people out. Met some people, God bless them, they're awesome, ministering to the homeless, ministering in the hood and doing this, you know, Mother Teresa type stuff. And they're so mad at the rest of the world because of the injustice of how these people got here that they, they don't smile anymore. I'm like, dude, you can enjoy this ministry and just know you got a grace. That's why you can put up with things that other people get frustrated in five minutes at. It's a grace that's been given to you. Don't be frustrated that the foot can't do what the hand could do. So, awesome study. How many of you have a basic idea of what your gift is? I did this, uh, we, we taught a series here at church and I had everybody stand up. Remember, uh, some of you were here for this. Stand up around the room in seven different categories. Which one you primarily lean toward? It was a two-thirds of the church went over for service. And that spoke to me because we were pretty, it was most everybody was here that day. And that really spoke to me as a shepherd about what God's wired into the house. So it really helps to know if you're going to build something, you know, if, it, if Craig or Joel, for example, would drive by a work project, you could tell what was going to be built there based on the piles out in the, out in the front of that project. You would know what construction, what kind of building it's going to be, roughly how big it's going to be, what you know, particulars there might be in it because the building supplies were dropped off. So it's a good way of knowing what a church is called to do when you can see what the rough gift mix is. I think it's time to do that again. We've had a significant number of new people here since we last did that. I'm very curious to see what God's added to the church since then and see if he's answered my cry. But anyway, so um, the rest of the chapter then is kind of nuggets of, you know, uh, almost like reading Proverbs. Of those, which one do you find the most challenging? Which one's the favorite of that passage? I'm just curious. The remainder of chapter 12, which one really leaps out at you the most? Which one personally challenges you the most? Either of those. Of the, uh, yeah, from verse 9 on, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, from verse 9 on, let love be without hypocrisy. And it's a bunch of bullet points of, here's some things, you know, just some advice on how to live together in harmony. Plus there's a persecute you is really fun. Well, yeah. <laughs> if you can get that, you've got it all down. I, I'll tell you what, you got love perfected when you can do that. <laughs> um, I was, was going to say with that one, I think it's really neat, though, because I used to get really hung up on that one with some things going on in my personal life, and I, like... Surely that's not what the Lord means, you know. Like, like, of oh, that one right there. Yeah. <laughs> like, what does he really mean by that? But the cool thing is that when I have been obedient in moments and done that, mm -hmm. like you experience it's not about the situation, it's like you experience God's mercy and love for you in such a deeper way. Yeah. And you obey that. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. I, I'm not perfect, but when I have been obedient <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. There's a, real, there's a real spiritual work in that. Every time we allow ourselves to be stretched into something that we're humanly not able to do, God fills us with the measure of grace necessary to do that, which means we're being blessed by whatever it is that we're giving. That's the concept of it's more blessed to give than receive. Because in order to give, it means we have to receive it first. Yeah. So we're twice blessed. We get the blessing of receiving it from the Lord first, and we get the joy of giving something away that we know came right from the heart of Father. Sometimes it's an it's awesome process. To give to receive something. I find. Oh, I know that. Yes. <laughs> yep. So that's where you're back in 1 Corinthians 12, where you're going to be reading over and over again. I will not be the part of the body that says, I have no need of you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But uh, 
Steve's who else? Were, yeah. You know, Steve's were a couple weeks ago at church you know, up front. It really hits there with the 15th, 16th, and 17th verses. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep Come on. With those who weep. Yes. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate yourself with the humble. Mm. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Mm. And if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And that, that just mm-hmm. covers so much of what he was just speaking. Oh, about. yeah. It was just so, yep. That was so powerful. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. Yeah. And it was my heart exactly. You feel like being with each one individually, and some are rejoicing and some are down. And you don't know, you know, you just want to be there for them. Yeah. And with them. Mm-hmm. Amen. And another thing I got with that, which kind of speaks to something else you said, was, um, like, I was I was hearing as he, as Jesus, like, felt and related to us in our pain, whatever, mm. that he dealt with it righteously. And I was like, I didn't understand that terminology until I really just like oh, yeah. meditated on it. But it's like he didn't get drugged down like you were talking about earlier. It's like he mm. he spoke to it like he he yeah. brought them out of it. And it's yeah. like he didn't come get down in the dumps with them. <laughs> yeah. Of, oh. yeah. Yeah. We, uh, you just triggered. Uh, he was the master of. Uh, this is something we say. You don't have to behave your emotions, so you can be touched with the feelings of infirmities. You could be grieved to the point of sweating drops of blood out of your skin, but you don't have to behave based on what you feel. And that's, I think, where you're getting at with that. That Jesus experienced it all, but never once caved and behaved out of his emotions. He was always in the fruit of self-control. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so don't we all that's why it's the fruit of the spirit and you know we'll, we'll keep bearing it and growing in it and all right anything else from chapter 12 chapter 13 that's fun be subject to the governing authorities man that's a word for the united states of america right now no more protesting in the streets <laughs> but i mean it had to have been a false preaching this especially like in Jerusalem, I mean, they wanted to overthrow Rome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, many of his followers mm-hmm. turned away because he wasn't overthrowing. Yeah. And, and now Paul's saying the same thing as Jesus yep. was saying. <laughs> yeah. Writing to probably a lot of Jews who were living in Rome under Emperor Nero. Yes. We've never had Nero for president. I don't care what anybody thinks about any president being the Antichrist or not, we have never had a Nero for a president. And that's the context that Paul wrote this in. <laughs> we grew up having nothing to do with anything of government. Oh, yeah. So, and even some of the laws we totally disobey because of the faith. <laughs> like, well, them. was it the whole heart of, well, should I obey God or man? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's a good one. It's, it was like, yeah. You can uh, do so many things, but then if it comes against what you believe, then you can go against what the law says, such as uh, yeah. bowing down to the image like Daniel. You know, He didn't bow down to the image, so that's the same thing. With, we weren't allowed to wear seatbelts in the car to us trusting in the seatbelt to save our life. Oh, well, that's, that's some awesome twisted One logic girl, right there. there was a girl <laughs> One more only. For her driving test, and she wouldn't put her seatbelt on. So she couldn't get a license. And the guy said, well, "Put your seatbelt on." She said, "I, I can't." And he's like, "Well, why not?" She said, "Because it's against my religious belief." He goes, "Well, what are you?" And she said, "A Christian." He said, "I'm a Christian, and I wear my seatbelt." <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why specifically it says, "Pay your taxes." <laughs> so many Christians would have bailed on the, hey, I don't want my money used to fund abortions and, and whatnot. I ain't paying taxes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I might have been reading into this, but I thought I might have been picking up on something with this whole chapter. Was mm-hmm. like, It goes into all these things about obeying the government. And like 10, it says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. It's like everything's about like doing what's right. And then in 11, it says, do this, do this. Knowing that this is a critical time, it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep, less mm. spiritual complacency. I didn't bring my glasses tonight. 
<laughs> so our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in Christ. Then mm -hmm. the night, this present evil age, is almost gone in the day of Christ's return. If he wasn't even alluding to, it's like you don't want to be in prison right now because it's mm. just about time to get out of Dodge. It's time to get out of Jerusalem. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, to Jerusalem, and also you don't want to be in one of Nero's prisons if you lived in Rome, because they were about to endure some intense persecution there, too, in the years ahead. But yeah, that's, that's a good word. All right, anything else? What are the limits, then? I mean, we joked around a little bit, but let's be serious for a minute. Try to be serious for a minute. Obey every governing authority, for there is no authority except from God. Whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. Are there any exceptions to that? I mean, I just quoted an apostle when I said, you decide for yourselves whether we should obey God or men. So the apostles disobeyed the governing authorities of Jerusalem when they told the Sanhedrin, we're going to continue to preach Christ, because that's what he told us to do. So what are the boundaries here? I can't say if, it, if it conflicts with the word of God, okay. then you can disobey. All right. Or whatever it is. Like if they would pass a law that we had to bow down to some, pray to some statue every day or something, then we would mm -hmm. disobey it. All right. I got that right there at work. You know, we're not really supposed to bring religion, as they call it, into work. We're not really supposed to talk religion or politics. But I pray mm -hmm. with people. We talk about mm -hmm. God. You know, it's... Well, I can't, you, you yeah. say you're federal government, I'm state government, but, but I mean, you <laughs> say you're not supposed to. But what document did they ever give you? I mean, yeah. in, in, in my entire career, 28 career, nobody ever gave me a document saying I can't yeah, they didn't yeah. say mm -hmm. preach it. So, so I preach it every day. What about your signing? So. What did you sign? Huh? Like, what did you sign? That's yeah. in your yeah, clause? No, that, Is there um, anything in your clause? That's one of the no? documents we have to look up. I think there may be something on that. Yeah. That's one thing. It may be. I mean, I had to sign documents about not talking about politics, but nothing yeah. about yeah, we can't saying I'm Christian. Yeah. yeah. Tina being working at the library, they're they're not allowed to say they they're told they're not allowed to yeah. talk about Yeah, I mean mm -hmm. I, I've been told but I haven't been when I asked for the paper I never got any, so mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well that's that's one of those lines. Is it actually the law or is that just a bureaucrat's interpretation of the law because they're anti Christ and they're trying to suppress you not they're not enforcing the law. They're enforcing their own conviction on you. That's good. That's being wise as serpents and harmless as doves and learning how to do it. There was a guy in Boston, Bruce Wall, who worked for the Department of Children and Youth. I forget what they called it there. And he was a solid believer, like an apostle planted churches in Boston. And uh, we asked him, so how do you do that? How do you work for the state government running children and youth? And yet you're an on-fire for the Lord street preacher. How do you do both? He said, well, they might think that there's a separation between church and state, but they know separation of the Holy Ghost and the state as long as I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so he just, I mean, for he, I don't know how long he'd been there, more than a decade, and he found opportunities to pray and never got in trouble. God just covered him like Daniel. He was like a Daniel in that place. And, yeah, when yeah. you reprimand, you just give him a word of knowledge. Yeah, but <laughs> that's it. But, you know, and that's why, you know, the whole thing is love, as Steve really well pointed out, love does no wrong to a neighbor, so love's a fulfillment of the law. It's really hard. I mean, there are some that become hard enough that they will persecute people for righteousness sake. But that's really rare. That's not as common as, you know, we Christians in America, so I'm being persecuted right now, they're making fun of me at work. You know, that aside, there really are very few instances where we're actually being persecuted and where people are willing to actually go to the mat for people that they know who have behaved honorably in the workplace. In other words, your love and your reputation in the workplace lays a foundation where people really don't want you to go. Like even, and I've had so many testimonies of people where somebody wanted to fire them, but everybody around was like, yeah, but they, they like make this place fun. They make this place peaceful. They're always there for me. They, you know, they, they came to my house in the middle of the night when I was going to commit suicide, you know, whatever. Um, so we don't want them to go. We love having them here. And so they even cover up sometimes for those times that you're praying with somebody illegally off in the corner and 
and that. So that's it. We behave that way and pray God covers us. I got through um, seven years in the Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston like that. Uh, and the guy told me at my interview, he said, so no preaching. Don't bring a Bible here. You can't have Bible study. I said, okay, can I just do this then? Can I just, if somebody asks me a question, can I just give them an honest answer to the question? So I don't lie to them about what, what I'm about. And he said, sure. Seven years, I prayed with hundreds of kids and their parents, just based on that alone. Live the witness and trust that God will do the rest. It's amazing stuff. Ben led somebody to the Lord in the boys' club. <laughs> Man, a kid, a kid got in trouble. He was sitting on a bench in the gym. Ben went over, six years old, preached to the kid and came to the Lord after I kicked him out of the gym. <laughs> All right. So chapter 14, food sacrifice to idols, 2.0. Any new insight into this? This is actually, if you want the Buian Cube version of what do you do with issues of conscience in the body of Christ, Paul gets it down to one chapter here, what he took three chapters to develop in 1 Corinthians. So what do we see here? What's new? What are some phrases that really leaped out at you to help us deal with those issues we talked about in 1 Corinthians? Things that are more matters of conscience than matters of sin. Like universally, this is always a sin. In verse 5 where it says, each one should be fully convinced of their own mind. Come on. That, that, <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. It helped really clarify it for me when I read that piece. Yeah. You know. Yep. So you are free to be 100%. I will go to the mat. I know I'm fully convinced this is right, but I'm not going to require you to agree with me. That's powerful. Did you notice what that one was about, by the way? It's, uh, the day, isn't it the days? About the days, yeah. Saturday or Sunday or Friday? Or, yep. yeah. yeah, so I used to think that was just about celebrating the Jewish holidays, right? The Feast of the Lord. And I've had good friends that I love who preach and teach the Word, who some of them know the Bible way better than I do, sit with me and try to convince me that we should keep celebrating all the feasts. So I bring them to that passage. I say, be fully convinced in your own mind. But to me, one day is not more important than the other. I have Passover every day of my life. The angel of death has no hold on me any longer. So I don't need to do a feast and kill a lamb. Which, by the way, the Jews don't even do anymore. But anyway, that's another subject. But I used to think it was just for Jewish holidays, but this is for Christian holidays, man. You get around, well, just check out Facebook before Easter. You want, go and look for it. How Easter is a pagan holiday. Easter is Esther, the god of whatever and whatnot. And you know what's amazing? Is, and then, you know, Christmas was a pagan holiday. I don't even know what it was called. Do you know the only reason why people even know what those two holidays are is because of Christians telling everybody, ah, this is a pagan holiday. The world forgot what that pagan holiday was. We hijacked a pagan holiday and now all the world celebrates Christ on both of those days. Praise God, man. We displaced whatever that demonic God was that was being worshipped with two awesome days to celebrate. Anyway, I'm getting off that soapbox quick because that... <laughs> That was Reformation Day. I tried that one, but it sounds too boring. And they see pictures of Martin Luther with the funny hat. And I'm like, I don't know what's that all about. Yeah, I, I don't know. Who, tries to do that too. who did? I knew someone else who tries to do what you do too. Reformation Day? Reformation Day. It's, it's great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Christmas was to cover up the Germanic tribal uh, Yule Festival. Winter Solstice. Oh, is that what? The, yeah. It's celebrated. The life of trees, and they bring, they worship the trees. And stuff. That was some wacky stuff going on, and nobody even hears about it anymore. You know why? Because we hijacked it, we took it over, and now it belongs to Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be an awesome day if we could get Halloween back into something more, 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 more gooder. <laughs> I like the uh, notes in my Bible for that verse about the day. It's um, and I'm not going to read it all, but just this section. It says, We are not supposed to live by default doing what most others are doing or being swayed by the strongest voice. We may find that we need to change our original conclusions, but we must do so thoughtfully, not impulsively. We must not mm. condemn others who come to a different conclusion. That's really good. That is well said. Amen. All right. The verse is not to judge, not to judge them because they're more or less they have a little bit different belief about this holiday or, or Sunday or Saturday, whatever it may be. If you're, yeah. It's, 
Mm-hmm. Not to judge them if that's what you want to do, and that's what you're fully convinced in your mind. I'm fully convinced the other way, so yeah. that's up to you. That's mm-hmm. between you and God, not me and you. Yep. I've tried to instill this in my kids and in everybody else that I've discipled that so long as you've come to your conclusion by seeking God, by walking with Him, and by searching the Scriptures, whatever conviction you come to, live it out. But if you've tapped into some other philosophies and just going with what the world's doing, I mean, we just read, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. So if you're just doing it because everybody else is doing it, or you're just doing it because it's trendy or whatnot, pause and get a conviction that comes between you and God about it. And that's, that's really what it's about. And that one, you can come down on any, any number of things. If you're, yeah. What indeed? (laughs) Well, Facebook would be out of business by now, I think. But (laughs) yeah, yep, amen. Okay, so um, chapter fifteen. Any? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I moved on too quick. Go ahead. Yeah, I was because this one's towards the end of fourteen. Or I do still come back to like uh, I was looking at verse fourteen. Um, I know I'm convinced in the Lord mm-hmm. Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but nonetheless, it is unclean to anyone who thinks it is unclean. And I just put, and I, I, I may have asked this before, but I may, I'm asking it in a different <laughs> way when we were in Corinthians. But if, if someone thinks that they need to do something and they're fulfilling the law, if they're still doing that because of the law, it's like, Shouldn't we tell them you don't need to do that? It's like you're yeah. Under the law anyway. Yeah, well, I think that's a really good point, Steve. I'm so glad you said that. It is important, again, in developing our convictions, if we're using the Word of God to back it up, that we've rightly handled the Word of God. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. So you don't need to do that in order to be righteous. If that's the source of the conviction, I think just a little bit of good Bible study and a little bit of teaching might help with that. That's totally appropriate. That's not messing with the kind of convictions Paul's talking about here. This is, by living by the law of the Spirit, I've come to a conviction about something. Like for me, as I shared with you, I think early on, especially in my walk, I'm not going into a bar. First few years, walking with the Lord, I will not go into a bar because I know that that smell is going to tempt me back into a life that I've left behind. And I knew in my weak, early faith, I can't handle that. I, I mean, for a while, I didn't even go to the beach without my wife because that was an area of sin I gave myself to. So I had a conviction about that. Now, should I have spread that to the whole church? Absolutely not. But for me, that was going to be the law. And it was a conviction I had from the Lord, so I had grace for it. I didn't need Bible verses to back it up. I just knew that for me... That's not going to happen. So that's, I think, does that help? That's like a distinction there. So yeah, if it's based on somebody's quoting the Word and mishandling the Word of Truth, that's, hey, let's talk about that. If that's the reason why you have that conviction. <laughs> Come on. was saying it really backs up with what I've been working with uh, that one fellow at work that's been a little confused about some of the scriptures and mm-hmm. why he wants to sell everything and because he wants to live as Jesus did and some of the things that he was doing was just like like well what he wanted to do because uh, he wanted to be he said he wanted to pray as Jesus did he said to go into your room lock the door and he said nobody can pray in secret mm-hmm. he said that's the way we should do that. Said, only that way, right? Only yeah. that way. So I pointed out a few places that he played in public too. He says, well, then he's telling you to do one thing and then he's going to do the other. Thing. It's isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I said, you got to look and see what it is that he said that. Before. Yeah. You know, and explain the scriptures mm-hmm. why he did what he did. You should come to a class on how to rightly handle the word, mm-hmm. how to read the word, all of it, and, mm-hmm. and that. It's an important thing. I mean, that's the source of all religion is a mishandling of the word of God. Mm-hmm not taking it seriously enough to invest the time and to really come into a full understanding of the sum of your word is truth. 
You can't pluck a verse out and say, there it is. It's in black and white. So what else does it say about that? And then it gets fun. All right. That's chapter 14. Chapter 15. The principle of love. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. That verse might be the purest definition of maturity that there is in the New Testament. How do you know that you've come to spiritual maturity? That your strength, you view it as a means by which you can bear up with the weaknesses of those who are weak. So the foolish, the the ones who are spiritually immature, the ones who say and do things that you know are wrong, that you're so strong spiritually that your instinct is to respond with, let me help build you up. I want to strengthen you so you no longer struggle with this thing. Um, but anything else you saw in chapter 15 that's all about life and community? And I think just to add right to that, the second verse there, let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Yes. <clears throat> for his good. Mm-hmm. Amen. All right, so chapter 16. This is one of those chapters. You know, remember the, the what was it, the prayer of Jabez? Remember that book? Like somebody was reading through the begats and instead of skipping over it like most of us do, they actually read what it said. Saw this nugget there about Jabez and created a whole movement. And this is, chapter 16 is one of those, you know, it almost sounds like, hey, say hi to so-and-so for me. And hey, this guy says hi and, and so on. But there's some really powerful nuggets of truth in here, mainly about women in ministry. There's a lot of other stuff, but I I like to just pause for a minute because this is a chapter that really challenges the whole notion that Paul, Peter, James, and John taught that women should not hold offices of leadership in the church. So let me just break down a couple of the greetings for you. And and this this ought to create a healthy tension that even if you've read other scriptures, we've covered some of them already, 1 Timothy, we'll, we'll get into one that's the most intense of all, I think. But we've covered in 1 Corinthians, let the women speak, stay silent in the church, right? Which nobody enforces, which is funny to me. Because some who are adamant about the other scriptures about women kind of hop over that one. Like, I ain't going to tell the women to keep quiet to you. Nope, not me. <laughs> because they're wise enough to know that. But these are offices. So either Paul is a complete hypocrite writing a letter to Rome and establishing churches another way. Or we've got to really dive into the Word and understand it, which we've done already with some passages. So here's the first one. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Two verses. This woman... Now, we, we translate it servant, which is fine. The Greek word is diakonos. It's where we get our word deacon from. So deacon doesn't always mean you hold the office of deacon in a church. But the way that word is used in the New Testament, every time the word deacon is used, it's used to describe a servant leader in the body of Christ. So Paul used it to describe himself in Colossians 1.25. Of this church, I was made a minister, a diakonos, a servant. You could translate it either way. Sometimes, unfortunately, your translation may lean toward the interpretation of the translators. <clears throat> Women should not hold office in a church. So when Paul is speaking of himself, he's a minister. When it's a woman, though, she's a servant. And interestingly, this is the only time when that word is used that it's translated servant in context of just speaking about a person. Go ahead. Amplified. It says, I was reading this deaconess, deaconess, <laughs> as a female deacon. Yeah. But is it diaconess? Is that what it's... Is that no, no, no. That's the, well, deaconess is the female version of okay. deacon, which I don't know why we do that. We know it means a woman if she's female. But yeah, yeah, like prophetess. Well, you don't call us a teacheress, you know, this, this, anyway, yeah, so, yeah, but no, you're right, deaconess would be a female, so that's good, the Amplified did it justice. In the footnote in here, he says, Phoebe was known as a servant, the Greek word used here is often translated deaconess. Yeah, so known as a servant can almost seem like, well, she's just like a gift of helps, and she's going to be really helpful to you when she gets there, but that word is never used to describe anything but a leader. 
So she was a servant leader, maybe even a deacon. Um, in fact, in Romans 13, that same word is used. We just skipped over it, but remember describing the governing authorities, how they bear not the sword in vain. Uh, rulers are, are not a cause for good behavior, but for evil, so be afraid. He doesn't bear the song for nothing, for it is a minister of God. It is a diakonos of God, speaking of governing authorities. So the governor, the centurion, whoever it is who's over your area, same word used to describe them. So all that's just a long way of saying that this woman was a leader. This was not just, uh, hey, I'm sending somebody who's really gifted and helpful to set things in order. She's a leader. Um, a sister. Not, she's come to assist you. I'm sending her to do some things, and she's going to need some people on her team. She's going to lead a team, help her in what she's called to do. Because she herself has been a helper of many. This word helper is awesome. It's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word ezer. You may have, uh, if you've heard me teach about marriage, starting in the book of Genesis, the, let me create a helpmate equal to him, a helper equal to him. This is the word ezer. In the Old Testament, that word, all but uh, four or five, all but no, I'm sorry, all but twice is used to describe God. Unto the hills I will lift up my eyes from which my ezer comes. My helper comes. That, that ain't no servant coming down off the mountain with some water to wash your feet or something like that. That's God. <laughs> so when God said, I'm going to make you a helper, a helpmate for you, he's like, you, you need God in your life. I'm going to give you a woman. <laughs> Usually the women really like that one when I say that. But, but anyway, the, the Greek word is prostasis, and it always refers to somebody who has authority powerful authority like caesar level authority it's used to describe caesar he is the prostasis of rome was a phrase used to describe the caesar the helper of rome i'm a benevolent dictator i'm gonna cut off your head if i don't like the way you looked at me but i'm a benevolent dictator but that so she wasn't that used to describe caesar all right so she was a leader phoebe was a leader and the first one that paul mentions out of the gate in this passage but we're not done yet so the next verse, verse three. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Because uh, we are running out of time. Uh, verse three. Greet Priscilla or Priscilla and Aquila. There it is again. The woman named first. Very unusual, almost unheard of, in ancient literature, Hebrew, Greek, or Roman alike. Always the man is named first in a married couple. But greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, my peers in Christ Jesus, not those who serve me, but I view them as equal with me on that. And drawn in then verse seven, uh, greet Andronicus or greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. It's all these women that he's greeting. Mm -hmm. Greet Andronicus and Junias. How many of you have... Junia, with no S after it in your Bible. Uh -huh. Very interesting. That's a play that some translators do. I don't want to call them deceptive. In the Greek, Junia is the actual letter-for-letter -letter translation of that name. But in the Greek, that's the female form of that name. If you had an S after it in the Greek, it makes it a male name. So in the... Oh, did I say that? I always say that backwards. Junia in the English is a male name, it is a female name in the Greek. So this is a, maybe a married couple or maybe just a man, woman who worked together. My kinsmen, so they were Jewish, and my fellow prisoners. So they, got, they did time with Paul somewhere, which is hard to track because he did a lot of time. But anyway, <laughs> they who are outstanding among the apostles. Mm -hmm. They're apostles. Junias was an apostle. Now here's the question I always ask all my friends who are all about women should not hold office. What does an apostle do in the church? What have we seen in reading the book of Acts that apostles do to a church? What's their role? Foundation. They build, they lay foundations. They lead the church. They lead. What's the first thing Paul did? Remember Paul on his first trip, we, we looked at this. After he'd been beaten at least twice along the way. He was an outlaw in three cities. He'd been stoned and left for dead at Lystra. And yet he went back to all the cities that he and Barney had been to. To do what? Encourage the believers. Encourage the believers and? To set up leadership. 
to establish elders in every city. Apostles established the local church leadership. So here's the question I've always got. How could somebody who's in an office described in the New Testament always as being the foundation laying, leadership establishing, anointed to do that ministry, but they could do that, but they can't serve as elders or pastors or teachers in the local church? They have to be quiet. So they could set them in. they got to be quiet when they come. That's hard to do when you're quiet. <laughs> How do I preach if i got to be quiet in church? All right. So that's powerful stuff. That's just a couple of verses there. You'll see it in any teaching you do about women in leadership because it's first apostles to establish the church. There's no way the women are excluded from establishing it. Make sure you go back and look at those four pesky passages one more time. I always say, all right, you got four passages that you want me to break down for you. I got 30. Come back to me with those 30. I'll come to you with your four. And nobody can ever come back with this one because it's right there. Either Paul was a hypocrite or these women were in leadership. All right. We got a half hour to cover the rest of the book of Acts. We're going to do it. We are going to be able to do this. Back on track. Unless Steve has a really deep probing question right now. No, He's got that look. Okay. Not, no, I'm just that. kidding. One thing I thought uh, of was 16 was how Paul said, said in other places, I make mention of you all in my prayers. And I always thought, <laughs> all of them really? And I and was in this chapter, I'm thinking, yeah. He knows them all by name. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And he's, who knows how many of these people he's even met. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right, first, any other questions about Romans? Uh, that's an epic book. I'm glad we took four weeks to cover it <laughs> instead of two. <laughs> yeah, it's still nowhere near. We, we did, a, I did a 15-week version of Romans a few years ago. It's recorded. You could get the notes if you want to dive in deeper where I broke it down more line by line. Uh, that's somewhere available <laughs> for you, I hope. I don't know. Ask Todd. I don't know where it is. But that's, that's there, and it, it's worth it. It's definitely a book worth going through and really chewing on, because every verse, as we discovered, trying to stay at 30,000 feet altitude, uh, every verse has got something worth meditating on and living. So um, that's awesome. All right. Just going Let's... into that, with the Romans when we first started, just made me think about... Actually, when I started reading it and studying into it, it made me think about my feel for the people that of where we came from. Mm. The same as Paul did for the Jews because of so much. There's, they have a zeal for God, but they don't have the Spirit of God. They don't have yeah. the Spirit to guide them in the Word. So mm -hmm. they don't have the knowledge that God has given us. They're not taking the faith righteousness. They're yeah. trying to establish their own righteousness. Yeah, which is what the same, mm. same yeah. ideas. Yeah. Same as the Jews. With how free you guys are and how full of grace you are, only because I trust your word do I believe you were ever a part of a group like that. Mm. To, it's like trusting that Paul used to be a Pharisee. Yeah. I'm like, really? Come on, you just got a costume. Justin could <laughs> never believe like, stuff that we would say. Yeah. He's like, no way. You know, no, you're so it's full like of grace like, now. One time when Shannon was, they went down to Philly, she took him to that church. Just to experience it. You know what would be fun? Gosh. We should take a field trip to that church sometime and just sit there and pray in the Spirit. This is a mission trip. Hey, if Paul would take a mission trip and go to the temple in Jerusalem, come on. We need to. We need to go in and bring the presence of God. I'm going to pray and see if that was an inspired idea or if that was just a good idea of mine. But that... That'll be, all right, let's get into Acts. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so um, Acts 21 through 28 is the longest story about the fewest years in all of the book of Acts because Luke was with Paul for the whole thing. <laughs> so we got it in living color this time. He's not hearing it secondhand through Paul or one of his other traveling companions. This is Luke's eyewitness account now of what happened when Paul got back. So... We'll get there. So after we're coming to the end of Paul's third journey, remember he was in the city of Corinth. Let me, um, let me just get that. He was in the city of Corinth here when he wrote Romans. And it says there was a plot against him. I'm back more in chapter 20 now, just kind of rehearsing that. So he wrote Romans. He wanted to travel back to Jerusalem, found out that there was an assassination plot against him. So he didn't get on the boat. He sent a few others to meet him in Troas. So 
Um, did I recommend to you guys Gene Edwards' series, The First Century Diaries? If you want a really good read, if you like historical fiction, he tells the story of all of Paul's journeys from the perspective of his traveling companions. They're brilliantly written, and he really is a master. He knows that he really brings the culture and the background in. The way he tells this story made me realize, man, this should be, like, it's, it's, um, it's like, um, what am I thinking of? One of them spy movies. It's like, um, I ca- I'm just blanking on it. Who am I thinking 007. of, Ben? Who? 007. It's like 007. It's like um, the Bourne series. Jason Bourne. I mean, he's there. So he has it like he sent some companions on a boat to fool the assassins who got on the boat with them, only to realize once they got out at sea, Paul's not on the boat. And then Paul, Paul by land, he went back. He covered in Macedonia, which is all these cities up here. We got Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi, three churches he established in that area. Spent some time around them. Probably spent a lot of time in Philippi. They seem to be really close with him. Then he met up with everybody in Troas. So that's what was going on there. In his heart, he's going back to Jerusalem, but he also knows he's going to Jerusalem on his way to Rome. He's already got prophecy in his heart, and he's heard confirmation, I'm going to Rome. How am I going to get there? Why didn't Paul just get on a boat and go due east? He could have gotten further away from people who wanted to kill him. Who knows? Only the Lord and Paul knows. But he went this way visited the churches he established, and then he has this time here in in Ephesus. So we'll get to that in in a moment. Back on the timeline now, we're coming to the end of the book of Acts. So from about the year 53 AD, so we got 23 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. Church has been around for 23 years now when Paul started his so-called third missionary trip. Backing us up a few weeks now, he started in Ephesus on that one. First he traveled through Asia, visited all the churches, you know, the Corinth or Galatian churches he established. And then he hung out in Ephesus. Remember, he was there for a better part of three years, preaching and teaching daily in that place. Wrote a couple of letters to the Corinthians during this time. Uh, escaped another riot. But Paul was a revival one day, riot the next. And it was going to be that. So he finished that journey out in Corinth. And now he's on his way back. So we're in chapter 20 and 21 is when he shifts gears, starts heading back toward Jerusalem. So we're in the year 58 at this point, 57 into 58 at this point. Um, Jesus has been raised from the dead and ascended for 28 years as of now. And the temple in Jerusalem only has 12 years left until it's destroyed completely forever. So that's the point of history that we're in in terms of biblical history. The book of Acts ends somewhere in the year 61 with Paul in prison in Rome. How he gets there is the wonderful, crazy journey that that we get in the next eight chapters. So I just wanted to make sure he had the historic timeline there. As I shared with you last week, Nero is on the throne in in, uh, Rome right now, but he hasn't lost his mind. Seneca at this point is still his tutor. He's still relatively sane, honors the Senate's role somewhat, as much as an emperor ever did. He hasn't gone mad yet. He goes mad right after Paul's released from prison, which I believe was a sovereign thing. So that, where's Paul headed to after Rome? He told the Romans. After he gets to Rome, he told the Romans, oh, he's going to Spain. He's, remember, I didn't, we skipped over it in Romans, but he says, I'm coming to you so that you could pay my way on to Spain. <laughs> a little presumption, a little nice Jewish presumption there. So, so that's his heart. He's going to get to Spain too, but first he's going to Rome. He said, I'm going to preach to Nero. i got to preach to Nero. Somebody's got to reach that man for Christ. So that's Paul's heart. All right. Um, he spends then three months in the Macedonian area. He's got seven traveling companions at this point. Did you catch that? Tim, who, well, I just, I don't even know. he's got two that we already have met, Timothy and Titus, but there's a few others. He's been gathering choice men from different cities that he's been to. So he's got Sopater of Berea. So he gathered another Timothy type disciple out of Berea. He's got Aristarchus and Secondus from Thessalonica. He brought them with him. Gaius of Derby. Uh, that was the place where he got stoned and left for dead. Uh, Timothy, who was from Derby as well. 
Tychicus and Trophimus, also from the Galatian region in Asia. We don't know what city particularly they're from. But so th these are men to travel with Paul now. He's got his own, like Jesus had his 12. Paul seems to have his seven. Who's not named in here that's one of Paul's? Luke. Yeah, Luke. Well, Luke definitely is traveling with him a lot. We don't know if he viewed Luke as a peer or as a son. We're not sure how they related in ministry. I'll give you a hint. There's a book in the Bible named after him. But yeah, well, he, he, he would join Paul later on, but he's not with him right now. He wasn't with him on this trip, but he's, Paul wrote a letter to him. We got First and Second Timothy and Titus. Titus has already gone to, uh, to Corinth on Paul's behalf, so he's working with Paul. Titus was with Paul in Jerusalem when he went and visited with them for the council. He took Titus with him the uncircumcised Greek, just to be nudgy about it, I guess. I don't know why he brought him on that. But um, so he's got, anyway, so he's got this group of men that are with him. They hang out together in Troy. Troas is ancient Troy, by the way. That's where the Trojan War happened. So I don't know why. They seem to land there a lot and spend a lot of time there. It's, it's like a transition place in between. They stay there till after the Feast of Passover. Uh, then they move on to Ephesus, and they meet with the elders, not in the city, but out on an island off the coast. And there he delivers this message. What did you think about Paul's words to the elders, starting in verse 17 through the end of chapter 20? This is Paul with elders. He has established, he spent more time with these guys than any other church in the world. He spent the better part of three years raising these guys up, laying a foundation in Christ. This became a church that reached all of Asia. It was that powerful a church. So what did you see about what Paul said to them? He, know, he said, look, I'm not coming back, guys. I know by the Spirit that this is goodbye. So I want to share with you some last words of wisdom because I won't be coming this way again. So this is like his Last Supper experience with the elders of Ephesus. So... What did you see in that? What, what are some of the things? Take my example. Learn that. Mm -hmm. you know, this is how I, I was with you. I was humble. I, I tried to show you things. So remember that when you're leading now, mm -hmm. that you do that. Do it the same way. That's awesome. And yep. also keep your eye out for, for wolves that are coming in among the sheep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So savage wolves will come. They won't spare the flock. What else are people going to do? So a wolf devours, and then there's another kind of person that causes trouble. Gospel. I mean, they're going to uh, give a different gospel, more or less, however it's worded here. Really. Yep, they'll pervert the gospel. and perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Mm -hmm. So that gives them glory rather than to God. So that's what we look for. Mm -hmm. yeah. From among your own selves are going to be people that rise up, and they're going to teach false doctrine right in your midst. Mm -hmm. Keep an eye out for that. Guard the flock. Don't let that happen. Yeah, I mean, he really puts it to him in no uncertain terms. You are now standing in the place of the good shepherd here among these people. So take seriously your role, because I won't be here. You know, I, I can't say, don't make me come down there like I did to Corinth. <laughs> you guys, it's on your hands now. Can you imagine the trust? I mean, we, we talked about the trust Jesus must have had to ascend into heaven with the 12 there or the 11 left on the hill who still didn't get it about the kingdom yet. And, and just trust in there. Once you get Holy Spirit, it's going to be all right. Imagine, I mean, the trust factor of that. And here's Paul releasing this beloved church into the hands of these elders and praying to God that they can do it, that they're going to thrive and prosper and do well. That's, that's huge. That's really taking the prophecy to heart, knowing that that's really true. That's going to happen to me. I know I won't be back. Mm -hmm. I know that what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem is going to happen to me. You know? Yeah. Yep. He knows it by the Spirit, and as he tells, as we get to chapter 21, when he heads to Jerusalem, comes across Agabus. Remember Agabus? Agabus the prophet. This was a dude you listened to. He said, famine's coming, and famine came, like a big famine. All of the land <laughs> went under famine. So people went and took his word. What did you catch with that encounter he had with the prophet Agabus? He stayed at his house a little bit. He had some daughters who prophesied too. I mean, this man was the real deal. See the one that took his belt and tied up. Yeah. Was, was yeah. that a warning to Paul or just a picture of things that come? 
Well, yeah, a picture of things to come. Because Paul said, It was a prophetic warning. Yeah. yeah. But did God just want to let him know what's going to happen, or was he trying to get Paul not to go because it was going to happen? That's a good question. And that's a passage I pause on when I'm teaching prophets about the limits of your ministry. So Agabus, in typical prophetic fashion, made a big dramatic scene about it to make sure Paul got the point. They're going to tie you up like this, Paul, just in case you don't want to change This is what it looks like. This is what they're going to do to you when you get there. Did he, did Agabus say to Paul, thus says the Lord, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem? Yeah. No, but see, if you go back to the fourth verse, so that's what's confusing to me. It's finding disciples who stayed there seven days and told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Yeah. So... It's but, but that day isn't necessarily Agabus. No, it's not Agabus, but it was the. Uh, it's still through by the Spirit. It says mm -hmm. to me, Agabus did his prophecy the right way. This is what's going to happen. I'm not going to tell you it's right or wrong. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not going to interpret it for you. Yeah. This is yeah. what the Lord showed me, but I'm not going to interpret. It. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, but that you make a good point. It says, telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. That, I looked into that because I asked the same question. That's an interpretation from how it said. They, they spoke by their Spirit. Oh, this is so, I know, it has a capital S, so does mine. It's the same word, pneuma or pneumatos. I forget what version of the word it is. So, when, they, when it says they spoke through the Spirit, or through their Spirit, is another way of translating that. From their spirit, they spoke to him, urging him not to go. And what does Paul say in response? I'm going. I'm going. And look, everybody everywhere has been telling me the same thing. I already know, guys. That's why I came back. I know, and I know that I have to do this. That we don't know what the word was. Some have contended, and I'm apt to agree with some of them maybe, that maybe Paul wasn't supposed to go this way. He knew he was supposed to go to Rome. Did God tell him straight out, go to Jerusalem, get arrested, and get a free trip to Rome on a prison boat? This was Paul's Gethsemane. Mm, yeah. Wow, that's a really good point. Am I going to drink this cup while I go one last time to the Jews in Jerusalem? It says about when the Spirit warned them that, it wasn't, that he was disobeying the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. came to the conclusion that they saw, were trying to just keep him from the danger. Like when, yeah. when Jesus was telling about that he was going to be going to be crucified and yeah. the disciples told him not to go. Yeah. So they were just warning him more or less mm -hmm. not to go because they didn't want him to suffer. Yeah. So this is one of those things where, and I always hate to do this because it can almost undermine your trust in the Word of God. Translators do interpret the Scripture and how you word that can change the meaning. Like you said, I have a capital S in my Bible too, which always means the Holy Spirit. So if it was the Holy Spirit speaking through them, that was prophecy. Yeah, I have a holy in and that, brackets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, man, even the Amplified interpreted. The other thing would be like if, if he was being told by the Spirit not to go there, but he was determined to go anyway, then that's when Agabus would come in and say, this is what the Holy Spirit says will happen to you in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now that you've decided you're going to go anyway, well, guess what, Paul? Here's what waits for you. <laughs> yep, we'll find out. We'll get to ask him, yeah. Uh, this is off topic, so if we want to keep talking about it. <laughs> reading back through this chapter, something that really stuck out to me is every new place that he's going in this chapter, Luke makes it like really clear to whoever is reading this book that everyone is super stoked to see him and very bummed out when he leaves. Yeah. Like he's, he's devoting like a sentence or two mm. every single paragraph of places that he goes just so we understand how much he's ingratiated himself in every single place that he's been before. Wow. Why? Why did Luke think that, that it was that important that mm -hmm. whoever's reading this knows how much he's endeared himself to every single city that he's been? That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, remember when Paul started out in ministry? They were afraid of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now look, 28 years later, they can't wait to see him, and they cry heavily when he leaves. Even now that he's back in the promised land, right near all... I mean, these are now the grandchildren, maybe, of the people he persecuted. And he's being received with like a royalty. 
Awesome. That was a great insight. I never thought of that before. Okay, so um, let's move on quickly through this because I'd really like to get at least to the shipwreck. That's fun. Uh, chapter 22 then, we have Paul now. He's, he comes to Jerusalem. Oh, wait, first let's look. He, he starts out back in chapter 21. I don't want you to miss this. He comes to the Jerusalem church. James is still the lead elder of the church. Did you catch anything in that passage? that concerns you. This is chapter 21, verses 17 through 26. Mm -hmm. He arrives in Jerusalem. The church greets him warmly. They love that he's there. Like Ben just pointed out, he meets with James. And James says some things to him. Did you catch that? And does that bother you as much as it bothers me? To pay, to uh, take the value mean and pay. Well, what they asked him to do. Well, why did they ask him to do that? Verse 20. Check out verse 20. You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Mm-hmm. Welcome home, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> the church has been thoroughly Judaized. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Like, that's where the Judaizing That part. The Judaizing. So, Peter wants them. What is, what is Peter saying to Paul? Like, what are we going to do now? Yeah, well, James, I, uh, I don't want to dig too deep and judge too deeply about what's going on here. But that they greeted Paul with a concern that, hey, word's gotten around, that you're going around teaching that the law of Moses is no longer valid. And the church here is really upset with you. So just to make sure that they don't get offended with you, we got these four brothers who are at the end of their Nazarite vow. Why don't you pay the offering for them when they bring their shaved hair to the temple? So that all of the church, this isn't about the Jews outside. He says there are many who have believed who are zealous for the law. The Jerusalem church, nearly three decades into the new covenant, is still struggling with what to do with the law. I believe personally that this is the reason why Paul, and I believe Paul was involved in it, and some other scholars wrote the letter to the Hebrews. Because the Jerusalem church was still struggling between these two things. They live, and this is the thing about all religious spirits, the closer you get to the center of that religious spirit, the harder it is to break free. You see it again in a major way in the Protestant Reformation. The closer you were to Rome, the more you were persecuted, the more you were likely to be hung on a rack and, or stretched out on a rack or tortured, the further away you got, the more free you were. That's why the revivals began in the British Isles, because at least you had the English Channel, at least, and a continent between you and Rome. Same thing was going on here. They were really struggling in the Jerusalem church to break free from that spirit. It appears the Judaizers had really won the day in the Jerusalem church. Not to change the subject, but oh, that's we were right. watching a National Geographic where Lisa Lang went over to North Korea and interviewed them, interviewed the people there, 20, 30 years ago, and this is before her sister was kidnapped and, and then released back in Clinton was there. So this is like going back oh, wow, to yeah. 40 years. And it shows the, the, the brainwashing and the fear tactics that they have used for centuries over these people that they mm. see, you know, Kim Jong Yao um, or whatever, all of the, his father, his grandfather, how they worship them. And, and it's like, can you, it's, it's that. They're just enslaved into that, and that's what religion is. It's just an enslavement of your mind and yeah. your beliefs to that this is what you truly believe, and how can this... They're, they're shaken to the core of this is what we've known for centuries. Yeah. This is all we've known, and now you're throwing this at us. Mm. You know, even just me coming here for the past year and a half, mm. it's a whole... I'm going through a whole gamut of... <laughs> and I'm, I'm not as ingrained in, in that as what the Jewish people were and yeah. their beliefs in religion was. But the religious things that I have believed over 50 years of my life, you know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's undoing that at the same time planting new to, for that revelation and understanding to come. Yeah. And if you're not open to it, it's that real struggle of back and forth. What do I do with this? Yeah. So I, get, I get where that oh, is. Yeah. And well, and all the more when you're surrounded by it. I mean, they lived in the culture. They lived under the nose of the Sanhedrin all along. They were always at risk of persecution mm-hmm. for that. You have fear involved. Mm. It's so hard to get your mind 
out of that fear. Yeah. Because you're afraid if you make the wrong move, it's the wrong move. So yeah. You have, it's a it's inbred into you so mm. bad that fear takes over without you even realizing. You think it's a natural way of life. Yeah. When I was in Morocco, I was told um, to be Moroccan is to be Muslim. Mm. To be Muslim is to be Moroccan. They were that's your people. national identity. It's your national identity. It's who you are. You don't know any other way of doing it because that's how it's always been done. Take that back a couple thousand years, you're not going to get rid of that root so easily. Yeah. No one that you have ever known has ever not lived like this. Mm. You're not going to get it out just, you know, in a snap. Yeah. Amen. You know, well, that's what they were wrestling with. The thing, but even then, they have to be, like she was saying, you have to be open to it. You have to be willing. Yeah. So that's why it's so, it's a necessity to have prayer ahead of time. Oh, yeah. Them open minded and open hearts yeah. will receive it because they won't receive it any other way. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to end here and just introduce Ephesians because I would like you to read that for next week. So. Um, their plan backfired, right? They say, Paul, go and make your offering with these guys. And then they raised some problems. Do you understand what was going on there? They had one of Paul's companions. I forget which one. Was it Tychicus or one of them? One of the Greeks that he brought with him. Probably showing him around the city, being a tour guide. And didn't take him into the temple, which was forbidden. Did you notice, though? The thing that incited the crowd to riot had nothing to do with what Paul was doing. You dare bring a Gentile into the holy place of God? I mean, anywhere near the outer courts. And they freaked. And that's what they hauled him in before the Sanhedrin about and wanted to kill him. And they were beating him because he brought a Greek too close to the temple. So was there zeal for God or was there zeal for the temple and their traditions? And uh, the, I mean, uh, the, Jesus called him on that. And that's always been the case for the entire book of Acts. That's what's been going on. So um, we'll get into Paul. Paul will address the mob. We'll get a chance to do that next week. But let me just, um, I'm going to move over here to get to the end because at the end of the book of Acts, we have Paul ministering now. He, he gets to Rome. And the point I want to make, because you're going to read Ephesians now, is that although he was under arrest, he was not in a prison. The book of Acts ends, verses 30 and 31, he stayed two full years in his own rented house. He was treated like royalty. Remember, he pulled his Roman citizen card out and he said, you better not beat me. And they freaked out of that and they treated him like a Roman citizen. But he also, I mean, they saw how Paul was greeted through the trips. You saw how every port they went in, the, the Romans were being hosted by the Christians. Even when they landed in Italy, the cities along the coast, as they walked their way to Rome, they were hosted by the church all the way there. So the Roman centurion and all the Roman guards who think they're bringing a trail of prisoners with them, they've experienced the shipwreck. They've seen the miracle. He got bitten by the snake, healed the, the son of the, or the father-in-law rather, of the, of the governor of the island. They've seen all this stuff. So they're like, if they're not disciples yet, they're at least in awe of Paul. So, and, and Paul's in charge. And the church is hosting this Roman entourage going there. So he had his own house and it says that he rented it. So some, like Paul said, you know what? You're not going to pay for my stay here. I got this. This isn't on Nero. I'll pay for my own house. While I'm your prisoner, I'll pay my own way. Thank you very much. That is kingdom thinking if there ever was such a thing. He's no victim of circumstance. He's not saying, hey, look, I'm your prisoner. I want three square a day and I want a nice cell. He's saying, look, I'll, I'll take care of all my needs. I don't need anything from you. I just can't wait to talk to Nero. Um, welcoming all who came to him. People were coming and going from his house. So the, the crazy thing with all of this, as you'll see, uh, we'll really cover it next week. He's guarded by Rome against the assassination plot against him. He's in the Roman witness protection program now. So he's guarded, protect not to keep Paul in, but to keep evil from touching Paul. He's under Roman protection, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching with all openness unhindered. While he's in Rome, then he's going to write four letters. And that's what we're getting into starting next week. The first three letters he wrote, Ephesians, Colossians and Philemon, he wrote first. So somewhere around 61 ish, 60, 61, he sent those three letters all together, traveling across the ocean to Asia. Along with those letters, well, I'll introduce it when we get to Philemon, but Ephesus is the first letter that he wrote. 
Obviously, the church we just read that he'd been to, this has been three years now, or maybe four years, since he met with the elders at Ephesus, because he's been in prison for three years in, in Judea before he came to Rome. So it's been about four years. He's writing to them now. Um, so really enjoy Ephesians. I doubt we're going to get all the way through it next week because it's doing to finish out Acts. We're definitely going to cover the first three chapters of Ephesians, hopefully chapter four. And maybe we can hop, skip, and jump through five and six, depending how many questions you have. No, we're going to get into marriage in that one. That's a hard one to plow through quickly. So, um, so I just want to make sure you knew the context of Ephesians before you read it. Although Paul was writing from prison, he wasn't in a dungeon. Philippians, however, most people believe by then he was just about to go for his audience before Nero Caesar, and he would have been kept in what was called the Mamertine prison. I'll introduce all of that to you because when you see 17 times the word joy and rejoice shows up in a letter he wrote, and I'll show you a picture of the cell he was in when he wrote it. I mean, that's what the tour guides say anyway. Craig was there. Um, you're going to see it's the most astounding letter ever written, I think, to reveal a kingdom heart in really dark circumstances. So he won't write that one for another couple of years after the book of Acts ends. All right, so we didn't get to finish the book of Acts, but we'll cover those last few chapters next week because there's some really good stuff in Paul's journey to Rome and how he ministered to the governors and the shipwreck and all that. So we don't want to miss that, but we'll definitely get into Ephesians next week. So please come ready to discuss that. I'm really looking for your input. I think what I'm going to start doing is in your study guides, putting more prompting questions in there. So I draw more out of all of you because I want to hear from all of you. Some of you, I appreciate your insights and what you're sharing, but I want to hear from all of you. So it's going to be as easy as reading what you wrote down on the paper. You don't have to think about it on the spot. All right. <laughs> I never do that. I notice when, you know how when, when you ask a question and you could tell like people look down, like that's, that says don't call on me because I don't want to say anything. And I, I know that. Teachers know that body language. down because it's been how long since we started, you know, a week ago I read those chapters. And oh yeah. Yeah, well that's why it's, if you could take notes so that, because I don't want to miss out. You guys have some great stuff that you share. I'm learning by listening to you guys in this, so appreciate that. Oh, it's okay. That, 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 that